Growing up on the cold, mean inner city streets of Baltimore is Netta, leader of an all-girl clique called the Pussy Pound. With no father and a dope fiend for a mother, Netta learns at an early age how to use her beauty and her body to get the things she wants, money, cars, and jewelry. Chasing the almighty dollar, Netta meets Black, a local drug dealer with a deep-seated hatred for New Yorkers who falls head over heels in love with her. With a broken heart, Black discovers that Netta is only after his money and he seeks the ultimate revenge against her. Author Shannon Holmes takes sex, lies, and betrayal to the next level in this action-packed, fast-paced, suspense-filled novel. In the midst of life's madness, find and escape Meow Meow Productions. Hey folks, welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal, Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Today on Ralph Reads, I continue the classic beloved novel, Be More Careful, by Shannon Holmes. No more hesitation or any trepidation. Let the reading commence. Chapter 5 Everybody knew everybody on the bus, so Netta stuck out like a sore thumb. By not knowing anybody in the church's congregation, naturally, she drew some curious stares. She returned their greetings with a kind one of her own, though she didn't care about them or their church. She only had one thing on her mind, boosting in the Big Apple. Running late, thanks to you-know-who, Tina, Timmy, and Mimi were the last ones to board the bus. There were only two remaining seats one next to the reverend's wife and the other besides Netta. There was no way Mimi was going to sit next to the reverend's wife and get beat in the head with scriptures all the way to New York. She rushed down the aisle to the other seat and let her mother and son sit there. She didn't know the strange face of Netta's having never seen her at church before. Hi, Mimi said, warm and inviting. Hi, said Netta, cold as ice. Quickly, Netta then turned her head towards the window. Oh, fuck you too then. What the hell is your problem? Thought Mimi to herself, reasoning at the same time that she was too nice to people. Netta completely ignored her. She thought Mimi was trying to get familiar, and she didn't need no born-agains all in her business. She went into her coach bag and grabbed her Walkman. Switching it on and turning the volume up, she prepared for the long ride to New York. Closing her eyes, flowing to faith, she was zoning as she pictured herself coming off with fly gear. Them broads at school will really be sick if I show up in some new unheard of fly shit. Netta thought, smiling to herself. Right next to her, Mimi quickly dozed off and her head gently came to a rest on Netta's shoulder. 
All those late night feedings had caught up with her. At first, Netta started to wake her up, but she looked so peaceful sleeping, she let it slide. In three hours, they'd be in New York, and she'd be getting jeggy. Finally, the bus arrived in Midtown Manhattan. It was a blustery winter afternoon in New York City. The lack of motion by the bus and Netta's sudden departure awoke Mimi. She opened her eyes just in time to see Netta hightailing it off the bus. As soon as she hit the pavement, she disappeared, blending into the sea of people on 34th Street. Netta was all business. She had a lot of stores to hit and only a few hours to do it. Not one to be intimidated, Netta walked down the streets of New York like she owned them, returning the mean look she received. She wasn't some dumb tourist amazed by the mass of people or gazing up at skyscrapers. She was on a mission and carried herself like a native New Yorker moving from point A to point B. She was in a rush like everyone else. First up on her list was the Fendi shop. There she boosted sweaters and khakis. Next came the Gucci shop. Netta thought she died and went to heaven when she entered the store. She boosted Gucci bags, slacks, shoes, and shirts, all high-priced stuff. She planned on keeping all this for herself, too. Damn, that was easy, she thought, as she made a clean getaway. Netta expected tighter security. She thought New York stores were more high-tech than B-more stores. With ease, she snipped, ripped, or popped her way through buzzer alarms and ink packs. It was like taking candy from a baby. Stopping back at the bus, she unloaded her haul. She wasn't worried about leaving her stolen goods alone on the bus. She was with the church. Who? would steal on a church trip. Checking the watch, she noticed two hours had already passed. She still had enough time to hit Macy's, though. Strolling carefree around Midtown, Mimi, her mother, and her baby looked every bit of the tourists that they were. They stared up at all the tall buildings and they actually stopped and gawked in amazement at the vibrant, scenic look of New York. Going from store to store, comparing prices till they found the best buy. They went to various department stores and boutiques. They stopped to eat lunch and to change the baby before heading over to Macy's. One of the world's largest department stores, Macy's had something for everybody. From yuppies to hip hoppers, Macy's featured all the designer fashions and was one of the biggest shopping attractions in New York. The children's department was their first destination. Tina and Mimi were looking at clothes for Timmy. When they were finished, they went from department to department browsing. Tina was notoriously slow and picky. Mimi's attention span began to waver. Anxious to get her own shopping spree on, Mimi huffed and puffed, dragging Timmy along behind her mother. Finally, Tina let Mimi go shopping on her own. The urban department was where Mimi again laid eyes on Netta. What a coincidence. It's the girl I sat with on the bus. Maybe she'd like to walk back to the bus together, thought Mimi. Damn, where'd this bitch come from? Netta said, cursing to herself. I hope she don't see me doing my thing. That's all I need, some born-again Christian turning me in. Fuck this holier-than-thou motherfucker. I gotta get mine. Netta stood there and debated whether she should or shouldn't. 
completely ignoring Mimi for the second time, and without a second thought, Netta went to work. Back and forth, she slipped in and out of dressing rooms, carrying hangers of clothes. She had DKNY, Sean John, Rockaware, and FUBU. These items were mostly to fill for her customer orders. It would pay top dollar to be the first in B-more to have this gear. It was common knowledge that everything hit New York before other cities like Philly, D.C., and Baltimore, especially clothing. Meanwhile, Mimi busied herself trying on gear, but her intentions were totally different from Netta's. She planned on paying for her stuff. She peeped Netta in the dressing room doing her thing. Netta kept bringing more racks of clothes while never returning any. I'm just gonna mind my business, thought Mimi to herself. Netta was going for the gusto, being greedy. She wasn't on her job as she thought shit was sweet. If she hadn't been slipping, she might have noticed the female store detective stalking her. Mimi saw her though. Mimi was being mad observant, hoping to catch a sight of a rapper in the Big Apple. Who could miss the white lady behind the mannequin? She was definitely 5-0. Mimi thought of a way to warn Netta that she was being watched. However, she didn't want to take the chance of being mistakenly implicated in her crime, especially if Netta got arrested. Decisions, decisions. Mimi decided to help the girl anyway, just indirectly. The opportunity presented itself when the store detective was hot on Netta's heels. Netta was on her way to the store exit escalator. Mimi watched Netta as she made her way down the aisle with the security officer proceeding behind her. As soon as the security detective attempted to pass Mimi, she jumped out of the aisle blocking her path, momentarily cutting off the pursuit. The store detective attempted to sidestep Mimi, but Mimi moved from side to side, right along with her. Damn, bitch, why the fuck is you following me? I ain't stealing shit! Mimi yelled at the top of her lungs, real ghetto. I got money too! Why ain't you following no white people? You must be prejudiced, racist bitch! You've been following me since I left the children's department! I'm warning you! You better stop following me, or you're gonna get more than what you bargained for, lady! Mimi's hostile words caused dozens of shoppers to stop and stare. Even Netta turned back towards the commotion as she made her getaway. The disturbance alerted her to the danger behind her. She put a pep in her step and raced for the escalator. Taking two steps at a time, she made her way down to the 34th Street exit. Looking around nervously, she kind of expected the exits to be swarming with security. But when they weren't, she thanked her lucky stars and tried her best to blend in with the other pedestrians as she made her way to the bus. Embarrassed, the store detective turned beet red. Ma'am, I, I, I wasn't following you, she said meekly, looking past Mimi for Netta, who had vanished just that fast. Oh, I guess I was wrong, said Mimi as she walked away laughing to herself. Offended, the store detective stood there, looking as if someone had just plucked her on her forehead. Back on the bus, Netta was sweating bullets, literally and figuratively. Boy, that was a close call, she thought to herself as she began to undress in the bus bathroom. All the clothes she had boosted, she wore in layers underneath her oversized black leather trench coat. Slowly, she peeled off the stolen merchandise, carefully folding each item. As she did, she couldn't help but wonder why the girl from the bus had looked out for her like that. Steadily, the congregation began to board the bus. Netta had already bagged up her goods and placed them in the overhead compartments. She was seated and listening to her walkman by the time Mimi arrived. 
Mimi walked onto the bus alone with bags in hand. As she made her way down the aisle, Netta watched Mimi closely. She seems nice. Maybe I shouldn't have brushed her off earlier. When Mimi reached her row, it was Netta who spoke first, breaking the ice. Girl, good looking out back there. If it wasn't for you, I'd be locked down right now, said Netta thankfully. That white security broad almost had me, she added with a smile. Oh, you seen her? asked Mimi, surprised. Yeah, by that time it was too late to pull all that shit back, said Netta as both girls laughed at the joke. Girl, I didn't want to see you locked up all the way in New York, you know, Mimi said sincerely. The more Mimi talked, the more Netta felt bad about how she had treated her earlier. Netta was touched. No one had ever looked out for her like that except maybe Miss May. Suddenly, Netta realized they hadn't been formally introduced. Girl, we've been talking and I don't even know your name, said Netta. I'm Mimi. My real name is Tamia, but everybody calls me Mimi. I'm Netta. Sure for Shanetta. Don't call me Shanetta, though, said Netta. And just like that, a friendship was formed. All the way back to Baltimore, they kicked it. She introduced Netta to her mother, who made the remark she hoped to see her in church on Sunday. Tina also made a mental note of how happy Mimi looked. She hadn't seen her this excited in years. Mimi brought her son to the back and introduced him to Netta. Netta never had the opportunity to be around a baby. She played with him and held him the rest of the way home. She even nicknamed him Tiny Tim. During the three-hour ride, Mimi and Netta split out the intimate details of their lives to each other. Though they had just met, it just felt natural. Mimi confided in Netta all the drama surrounding her family, the life sentence her one brother got and the death of the other. She talked about her father and her baby's father, Tuan. Netta was relieved to hear Mimi had problems, too. She wasn't the Miss Goody Two-Shoes Netta had made her out to be. Talking to Netta felt so good to Mimi, it was like they were long-lost sisters. A good listener, Netta soaked up all the information from Mimi and not once did she interrupt. She just communicated her feelings by a series of facial expressions and nods. After Mimi finished, it was Netta's turn. Picking up where Mimi left off, Netta told the story of her life. She spoke freely about her mother's drug addiction and her poor living conditions how and why she started boosting, and the violent death of her guardian angel, Miss May. For the first time in a long time, she let her guard down. It was wonderful not to be condemned for her way of life. It was as if a burden had lifted off her chest. What a relief it was to Netta to hold a quality conversation with somebody who was truly concerned about her well-being. She hadn't experienced this since Miss May died. Funny how time flies. The bus arrived in be more as scheduled. Neither Mimi nor Netta noticed the bus had even pulled into the bus station as they were too busy talking. A noticeable sadness traced over their faces like two kids who had to put away their favorite toy at bedtime. The girls exchanged numbers and said their goodbyes, reassuring each other they'd be in touch soon. All the way home in the car, Mimi couldn't stop talking about Netta. Ma, me and Netta have so much in common, I can tell we're going to be the best of friends, Mimi exclaimed. Then she added, Watch, she's the sister I never had, said Mimi with confidence. Tina smiled and continued driving. She was happy that her daughter was happy. This was the old Mimi. She hadn't seen her like this since all the trouble with the twins. Over the next few days, the girls stayed in constant contact by phone. The phone calls eventually led to Netta paying Mimi a visit. 
Since she was too ashamed to let Mimi see her apartment where she lived with her mother, she insisted it would be better for them to visit at Mimi's house. Mimi understood, and being as though Netta never invited her over, she never asked. Netta's visits became so frequent, they turned to sleepovers. Several months later, when Tina found out about Netta's home life, she asked her to stay with them. The invitation was a no-brainer for Netta. She didn't even ask her mother for permission to leave. She just packed up and left one day while Renee was out chasing dope. Before she packed, though, Netta carefully shook out all of her clothes for roaches and eggs. She didn't want to take her unwanted buddies with her. With no luggage, Netta put all her things into green garbage bags. Then she caught a hat to Mimi's house. The transition from the projects to Mimi's place was smooth. Tina thought so highly of Netta, she offered her the twins' old room. Netta graciously declined the offer. How could she move in there? The room represented itself as a shrine and had been left intact and untouched the way it was since the day of the murder and the arrest. Netta felt more comfortable in Mimi's room. Both girls welcomed each other's company. Mimi was ecstatic every night as she dreamt about Netta and sharing her room with her. Netta was her best friend, like a sister, so it came natural to share everything. She finally had the best friend and roommate she wanted all her life. The first few months of Netta's stay was like one big slumber party. Regularly, they stayed up to the wee hours of the morning talking and listening to the quiet storm on the radio. They seemed to never run out of things to say. Mimi talked about her sexual experiences and the pain of childbirth as Virgin Netta listened carefully. Netta knew about the birds and the bees, but she never did it. Mimi's tales of wild parties, clubs, boys, and sex intrigued Netta, sparking a curiosity of adventure she had never thought about. She was ready to see be more. Not just the hood, or school, or the projects, or Renee's junky ass. Many nights she dreamed of having a girlfriend like Mimi. She had always fantasized about going through the door of a club, all dressed up in whatever special Chanel design she copped for the occasion. Yes, heads will turn indeed. And no one would miss the fact that she was there. She always dreamt of having a sister or someone she could hang with, someone who knew the circuit and who knew where to go to be seen. It didn't take Mimi long to make her dreams come true. Hammerjacks was the first club they went to together. Netta was in awe at all the people Mimi knew. At 17, she had never been inside a club before. She liked the loud house and rap music that blasted over the club system. This social setting was just the perfect place for her to show off her clothes. She was in fashion heaven. Although Netta dressed down this night, wearing tight guest jeans and a matching guest shirt with sparkly diamond dots, she complimented the outfit with a red butter soft leather jacket and some Jordans. Even dressed down, she still shined. All night long, dudes were trying to holler. Netta and Mimi took a few numbers, but didn't give out their own. None of the cats appealed to Netta. She didn't plan on going out with any of them, so wasn't no need in all that swapping numbers rap. She may have been young in age, but she was mature beyond her years. Mimi, on the other hand, flirted constantly and had hustlers buying them drinks. Since Timmy, Mimi hadn't really been on the scene. It had been some time since she had been out or had a boyfriend, but now she had Netta, and she'd be smarter this time, not like with Timmy's father. This time, she'd call the shots.
As the night wound down, Mimi had some young hustler she knew drop them off home. Inside the bedroom, the two girls undressed and talked. Mimi eyed Netta's body closely. Every mark, every curve, everything about Netta's body she consumed with quick glimpses and subtle stares. When Netta turned her back to hang up her clothes, Mimi admired her dark, smooth skin tone and hourglass shape. As they spoke, she tried to shake it off, but she couldn't stop looking. She wanted to see her breasts as Netta stripped down to her panties and bra. Netta, paying no mind to Mimi, put her nightgown over her head and climbed into her bed. Tucked in under the covers with the lights out, the girls began their midnight chatter that usually lasted all night. Except this night was almost over. Mimi, I had a great time tonight. Girl, you sure do know how to get your swerve on, said Nena, giggling. I see you do too, giggled Mimi right back. Did you see them niggas sweating us, asked Nena. Girl, that ain't nothing. Wait till tomorrow. It's on, said Mimi, getting Netta excited. Where are we going? Netta asked, as if Mimi's answer was worth a cool million. We're going to the hottest club in Beemore, where all the ballers be. Odell's, she excitedly exclaimed. Chapter 6 Netta, help! Come here! Oh my god, Netta! Come here! Call an ambulance! Yo, Mimi through the house. Her cries shattered the peace and quiet of this tranquil Saturday afternoon. Groggily, Netta arose from her sleep and hit the floor running. Still dressed in her bra and panties, she flew down the stairs towards the screams that could be heard throughout the house. It was Timmy. He was hysterical. His screams weren't normal. They were agonizing to the ears. When she reached the kitchen, she saw Mimi holding little Timmy in her arms, rocking him back and forth in a feeble attempt to calm him down. Oh my God, said Netta, staring down at Mimi and the tiny toddler she was holding. Help! Call 911, said Mimi. Netta didn't have to ask what happened. Now that she was there in the kitchen, it was self-explanatory. She saw the scattered remains of an accident. An empty hot grease cup and its contents were spilt over the floor next to the table. Burnt french fries and hot grease still popped on the unattended stove. No, he didn't spill hot grease on himself. Tell me this isn't happening. For Netta, cutting off the stove and retrieving the phone to call 911 all in the same split second. He, he, he was, I was getting something out of the refrigerator and he was in his walker. He must have thought the cup was filled with Kool-Aid. He grabbed it and spilled it all over herself. Mimi said with tears streaming down her face as she continued rocking little Timmy. Netta rushed into action, grabbing a tray of ice out the freezer, wrapping ice cubes in a dish towel, and answering a hundred questions to a 911 operator with Timmy screaming to the top of his lungs. Finished with 911, she took Timmy from Mimi and applied the ice to the burned area of his chest. Little Timmy was having one terrible time. A small portion of his skin on the left side of his chest had suffered third-degree burns, and his skin was burnt away to his baby flesh. He kicked and squirmed as the coldness of the ice numbed his pain. After a minute or two, his screaming turned to crying. Taking control of the situation, Netta called Mimi's mother at work. John Hopkins University Hospital was where the baby was taken. It was a world renowned for its state-of-the-art medical procedures and advanced techniques. And fortunately for Timmy, the wound wasn't as bad as it sounded or looked. It turned out to be second-degree burns and not third. In time, it would heal. 
The doctor said that being through the accident happened while he was still young. The burn mark would fade as he grew up, possibly to the point where it would be mistaken for a birthmark. It wouldn't be so grotesque once it healed and in the years to come, possibly unnoticeable. The doctor washed and dressed his wounds, having Mimi watch carefully so she could do the same. Then the ER doctor gave Mimi a prescription for some pain medication he could take as a liquid and some antibiotic cream she would need to apply two times daily for the next two weeks. Mimi felt so guilty, she couldn't even be happy that it wasn't that bad. The doctor told her over and over that it could have been much worse had the grease fallen on little Timmy's face instead of his chest. Thinking of what could have happened didn't ease the guilt. However, Mimi was thankful her baby would be okay. Visibly shaken, Mimi never stopped crying. She was so hurt for her little boy and feeling so guilty she couldn't hold back the tears. Mimi, accidents happen. This could have happened to anybody, you, me, or your mother, said Netta, consoling her friend. Then why me? asked Mimi, breaking down with harder tears. He's going to hate me for this when he grows up, she said, pleading with Netta her case. No, no, he's not, Netta assured her. In a few months, he'll be healed and all this will be forgotten, she said, as she wrapped her arms around Mimi's neck and hugged her, patting her back, telling her it would be okay. In the aftermath of the incident, Mimi and Netta grew closer. During that time, Netta noticed a few things about her friend. She was very sensitive. She suffered from low self-esteem, and as beautiful as she was, mentally, she was weak. Forces outside herself always determined her happiness. That summed up Mimi in a nutshell, past being beautiful. Netta thought in light of the accident, Mimi's maternal instinct would have kicked in overdrive, allowing her to bond more with little Timmy. But it didn't. Instead, for some strange reason, after the accident, Mimi shielded away from her son, basically handing over her motherly responsibilities to her mother. It was Tina who grew closer to little Timmy, nursing him back to health, while Mimi reverted back to her old ways. Looking for love in all the wrong places, Mimi hit the clubs with a vengeance. Netta, being the friend she was, was right there with her, making sure she didn't do anything stupid. This was a low point for Mimi. She needed some type of release, and the club seemed to be the place for it. The parties, the weed, and the liquor all seemed to dull her pain, allowing a temporary escape. But it was here in the clubs that her past came back to haunt her. She ran into Twan one night at the Paradox. Bitch, what the fuck you done did to my son? Your yellow ass should be home with him right now instead of out here hoeing. Twan barked angrily. More than anything, he was mad at the fact she was in the club and looking good. He couldn't have her and now was the bigger problem more than his son's unfortunate accident. Not to mention, she was standing there looking cute as hell and would be cutting up any minute, but not with him. Twan, get the fuck out of my face with that dumb shit. It was an accident, she said furiously. Nigga, you got some nerve. When the fuck you gonna start acting like a father? Well, when you do, that's when you can tell me how to be a mother. She got that one off her chest, then turned and walked away heated. Bitch ass nigga, she said to herself as she walked along. Right then, Mimi made up her mind to fix Twan for trying to play her out in public, and she knew just how to do it. After dropping Netta off, she stayed in the car with Boo, another big time hustler from East Baltimore's Lafayette Projects, who just happened to be one of Twan's main rivals. Mimi knew all about their beef with one another, so when he drove straight to a hotel, Mimi didn't object. 
She went with him and had sex with him, doing it only to spite Twan, knowing word would get back to him. Thinking that this would hurt him, she never realized that besides a somewhat bruised ego, Twan really didn't care. He washed his hands of Mimi and the baby a long time ago. The next day, Mimi recounted her sexual escapade, blow by blow, to Netta, who listened to every detail and description Mimi fed her. He ain't hit you off in no dough? Asked Netta, puzzled by Mimi's story of revenge. It wasn't like that. I ain't cracked for no cash. I fucked him to get back at Twan, she said, looking at Netta, wondering why she didn't get it. Mimi didn't need money. She had family that took care of her. She wanted for nothing, so it wasn't about that with Boo. She was on some other shit. You mean to tell me? You let that nigga Boo hit it just because you wanted some get back? She asked, looking at Mimi as if she were crazy. Yeah, answered Mimi. Listen, I'm not gay or nothing like that, but um, you ain't no ugly bitch. So fucking you should be a privilege. A paid privilege. Niggas is trying to get with you, so you should make them take care of you, said Netta, wanting her to see her mistake. Netta, you talk the talk, but you ain't never been fucked yet, Mimi stated bluntly. Show you right, but when I do, I'ma get mine. You best believe a nigga fucking me gonna play his part, said Netta, meaning every word from the bottom of her heart. Then and there, the seed was planted and a scheme was hatched. Later on, as time passed and the future would present itself, Netta would show Mimi better than she could tell her how to handle a hustler. And sure enough, as the sun shines and the moon glows, her money green Mercedes-Benz 55 AMG slowly came to a stop right in front of Netta, who was standing at the bus stop on her way home from school. The driver of the vehicle was named Major. He was well-built, brown-skinned, and a getting money motherfucker from Park Heights. Major was attractive in a thuggish sort of way. Fortunately for him, by ghetto standards, his AMG made that nigga a real handsome motherfucker. Lowering his passenger side window, he leaned over in the seat to holla at Netta. Excuse me, miss, with the slim waist and the pretty face. You need a ride, he asked, cool like whip, giving her ass the wrist as he questioned her all the while signaling her out from the rest of her comrades. Netta frowned up her face, giving him the, You talking to me? Look. Persistent as ever, Major tried his hand again. Shorty, what's the deal? You want a ride or what? Four wheels beats two heels, baby, he said with a smile. That comment brought a smile to her, matching his. Netta was tickled. This big-ass nigga in his big-ass car broke the ice. However, she didn't want to appear pressed. How I know you ain't no rapist or murderer or something? She shot back. Now it was his turn to be amused. Come on now. I may be a lot of things, but a rapist I'm not. Do I look that bad to you that I gotta take some pussy? He asked. Nah, but looks can be deceiving. You know what? We can have this conversation while we ride, for real, yo. Finally, Netta relented and got inside the car. She liked the man with a sense of humor and, more importantly, money. She wasn't about to deal with no broke-ass nigga. She had decided that shit a long time ago. Think big, Netta. Think big and hold out for it all, she always told herself. And Major was large. That nigga has so much cash, Sylvester would say suffering succotash. Major had it going on with his hustle, his looks, his car, and his bling bling. Everything about the nigga represented. Netta has something much more valuable in her possession. Her pussy. Major turned out to be Netta's first boyfriend, but there was no question who wore the pants in their relationship. Netta did, and she wore them well, playing her part 
to a T. She had him wrapped around her pinky finger. She started trying him, asking for little things like small amounts of cash, gradually working her way up from leather coats to jewelry. Then she cracked on him for something way bigger and more expensive. She cracked on him for a car. Even though she didn't know how to drive yet, she wanted a car, and she got Major to agree to get her one once she learned how to drive. It didn't take Netta much to convince him to teach her how to drive, either. Netta learned the mechanics of auto operation quickly. Within two weeks of learning how to drive, she had her learner's permit. He was doing all this, and she still hadn't hit him off with some pussy. She built up his anticipation with mental foreplay. A kiss here, and a touch there, had him after a while begging for it, sweating her all over her, ignoring her stops and no's, which for him was unusual. Major was a major hustler. He was on big boy time and had big boy status. The way his pockets were holding made women simply spread their legs. He had so much pussy coming at him. The shit was overrated and not too many men would agree with him. However, he had so much pussy open for him, he could honestly do without it. Now, what he did need was a challenge, and Netta was it. When she told him she was a virgin, that shit only heightened his expectations of the sexual act, and Netta had him open. The fact that she wasn't like the other broads, giving him brain and letting him do whatever, made it a sport for him. A game he had to win. The challenge and the sport of it for a nigga getting dough was the rush for Major, and that's what was different about Netta to him. Not to mention, she was still a virgin. After three months of waiting, Netta finally gave him some, and it was too good for him to handle. Major ejaculated prematurely over and over again. he never been with a virgin in his life, and he was 23 years old. He couldn't believe his luck. She wasn't lying. Netta knew she had a bomb shot, too, after he broke her in. She threw it on him. Lust blinded Major, and he didn't realize that the sex she was giving up coincided with him buying her the car. Catering to all her whims, Major caved into this one too. Netta was his wifey, he reasoned with himself. If she wanted a car, then she should have one. So he hit her off. He bought her a little red Honda Prelude fresh off the lot, fully loaded with shiny rims, a system, and tents. This was the perfect car for a female, since it was so compact and easy to handle. With this gift, Netta learned a valuable lesson, one she would draw on later in life, which was a woman could lead a man around like a dog on a chain because men think with their little head and not their big one. Having already let her into his heart, Major let Netta into his world as well. He exposed her to the drug game. Streetwise and eager to learn, Netta made a good student. Her memory was photographic. Everything she saw, she remembered. He taught her how to cut coke. Then he taught her how to cut dope. She learned how to weigh drugs on the scales and bag it up. Major would have her bagging up coke for hours and hours at a time. Eventually, she could look at a package and weigh it by sight. Major taught her that, too. More importantly to her, she got a glimpse of how much money he was making. Netta has severely underestimated Major's hustling abilities. He was that nigga. The whole time Netta was seeing Major, her relationship with Mimi suffered. She tried to manage her time between her man and her friend, but it was hard. 
Mimi was demanding, even though she was happy for her girl. They still spent quality time together. Every night they shared the same room, and as usual, the girls would cut off the light switch and in the dark tell their secrets to one another until they fell to sleep. They vowed that no man would ever come between them. Secretly, however, Mimi was jealous. She was envious of the things Major was doing for Netta. She never let it show, though. That's because Netta was so humble and sharing. She taught Mimi how to drive, and she continued to school her on the game, the do's and the don'ts. Netta was surprised at how naive Mimi really was to the game. With her father and her brothers in the game, she was supposed to know certain things, and she didn't. She was supposed to know how to work niggas and peak game. No man was supposed to be able to run game on her, but that wasn't the case. It seemed nobody ever wanted to pull her coat. Use what you got to get what you want was the theme Netta echoed to her. Heavily influenced by Netta, Mimi got a car too, though hers came from a more conventional source. Her dad. She pressured him into buying it. The same make and model as Netta's, just a different color. It was all good with Netta. She was happy for Mimi. Happy they both were riding. Juggling school, Major and Mimi, Netta still got good grades and she would still graduate on time. School was easy for Netta, but hard for Mimi. Mimi's interest in school began to dwindle her junior year. Partying became more important than education. Mimi was so close to graduating, but yet so far. A couple of times she contemplating dropping out of school, but each time Netta talked her out of it. Mimi, you'll never accomplish nothing in life if you quit school. Once you get that diploma, they can't ever take that from you. So many doors will open to you and your son will respect you more, said Netta seriously, hoping her words motivated her friend to stay in school, cause her heart definitely wasn't there. As her relationship with Major began to get serious, Netta had a tough decision to make. She was debating upon taking Major up on his offer to move in with him. It had been weeks since he first asked, and he was still applying pressure. However, after serious deliberation on her part, Netta rejected the idea. Out of respect for Mimi's mother, she did not move out. Besides that, she liked the home environment there and she was comfortable. Graduating from high school was the first meaningful thing other than surviving that Netta accomplished in her life. She was proud of herself, even though she didn't know what she wanted to do with her life or what the future held for her. Having come so far against so many obstacles was an achievement in itself. The day of Netta's graduation was bittersweet. She woke up, looked out the window, and realized her Honda was gone. It had been stolen. And while she was surrounded on this festive day by all the people she loved, including Tina, Mimi, Little Timmy, and Major, there was a person not amongst her happy group. Talk about surprise, surprise. An hour later, her mother, Renee, showed up looking half decent. Renee, the only outsider in Netta's circle, sat in the audience alone. Netta barely recognized her mother and barely remembered sliding an invitation under her mother's door. Just being courteous, she never expected Renee to stop shooting dope long enough to show up. Still, there she was, looking out of place. They kept in contact over the past few years sparingly, communicating just enough to let the other know they were alive. Netta buried the hatchet somewhat after she moved in with Tina and Mimi. She still couldn't totally forget all the things her mother had done to her, nor would those things ever be justified in her eyes. However, the past was the past, and Netta intended to leave it there. 
Sometimes it is better to let bygones be bygones. In order to mature, she had to live life in the present. Her mother would always be her mother. No one can pick their family, only their friends. Netta beamed as she walked up on stage to receive her diploma. This was her day. As she shook the principal's hand and received her diploma, she looked out in the audience and saw her loved ones. Everyone was clapping and cheering her on. Miss Tina was busy snapping her camera and stopped as she stood next to the principal and gave a big Getty Murphy smile for the flash. Everybody was clapping and smiling, ready to go out and celebrate. Downtown and Fisherman's Wharf restaurant, they ate and drank champagne, toasting Netta's success. However, Renee was distant and noticeably withdrawn from the group. For the life of her, Netta couldn't figure out what was wrong, but she soon came to find out. As the evening ended, the group split in two, each walking to their separate cars. Before parting, Mimi and Tina took turns embracing Netta goodbye. Miss Tina looked as if she had tears in her eyes. Netta, we're all so proud of you, sweetheart, said Tina joyfully. I know, Netta, you did it, said Mimi with tears of joy running down her cheeks. I couldn't have done it without you, she said, looking at Miss Tina, then Mimi. I love you so much. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much, said Netta, returning their embrace. With everybody feeling sentimental, they hugged and kissed some more, exchanging pleasantries. Parting ways, Netta promised them she'd be home tomorrow. Tonight, however, would be spent with Major. Netta jumped into the car where her mother and Major awaited. She was dropping her mother off and then spending a night of celebration with her baby at a fancy hotel, or at least that's what she thought. Chapter 7 While driving through downtown Baltimore, suddenly Major made a detour to a nearby parking garage. Curious, Netta wondered what they were doing there. Inside the garage, Major drove around as if he were lost. It took a minute to find out what he was looking for. Then the surprise came into full view. Sitting all by itself was a brand new Burgundy 535i BMW with chrome dip deep dish rims and a big white ribbon attached. Surprise, said Major as he turned towards Netta. She just sat there, her jaw dropped down to her clavicle, and her heart began to pound faster than Congo drums. You got that for me? She said in disbelief. Yeah. Go on. He grinned back playing with her. I know that's right, Daddy. She said, forgetting her mother was in the back seat. She reached over and gave him a hug, kissed both sides of his cheeks, then looked in his eyes. You know I love you, right? She said, not needing to, but saying it anyway. You better. So it was you who stole my car, asked Netta, figuring one plus one must equal two. Major just simply sat there like the cat that just ate the canary. He didn't need to nod or say yes. His hand was exposed. You can't be mad, he said, reaching in his pockets for the keys he tossed at her. Netta got out of his car and skipped her ass over to her new ride. She jumped in and started it up. She adjusted everything from the seats to the mirrors. She played with the radio, setting her favorite stations. Then she opened the sunroof. She rolled down all the windows, then rolled them back up. She looked out her window and over to Major. I love my car! She yelled to him, smiling and waving. 
This nigga is really on his job. I'm so feeling him. I could really learn to love him, she thought to herself. Renee climbed out of the back seat of Major's Lexus coupe and joined her daughter after saying goodbye to Major. Netta was still fumbling with all the buttons and gadgets in the car. With her mother in the passenger seat, Netta pulled alongside Major's car. Leaning out the window, they made goo-goo eyes at each other. Thank you, Major. I love you, she said very appreciatively. I love you, too. We still long for tonight or what? He asked, hoping that she wasn't forgetting they were supposed to do it real big. He had champagne, a hotel suite, and was ready to do her. Of course, she looked at him like he was retarded. I'ma drop my mother off, then I'll meet you back at your house, she said as if they should synchronize their watches. I choked, he agreed with a nod as he pulled off with her exiting the parking garage behind him. Cruising through the streets of Baltimore, Netta headed for the projects. She felt like she was floating. Her car handled like riding a cloud in the sky. Whenever she hit the brakes, the car stopped on a dime, and whenever she tapped the gas pedal, the car leapt forward. She was in a trance, listening to the sounds from the radio until Renee reached over and turned down the volume. The lack of music snapped Netta out of her thoughts. She turned and looked confusingly at her mother. Netta, I have something to tell you. I don't really know how, but... She said as her voice went lower and lower. I have AIDS. The last part of her sentence stuck out and lingered in the air like an instant shockwave. It literally hung there, shocking Netta as it echoed over and over and over again. Not AIDS, thought Netta. She looked at her mother. After all these years that her mother had been shooting dope, Renee had never once overdosed. Now she was telling her this. The doctors say it's full-blown, and the medication they tried ain't working for me. They said there isn't nothing they can do for me. Dr. Peters says I only have a couple of months to live, said Renee, as a tear welled in her eye, and she took in a deep breath, knowing her destiny was an imminent death. What? asked Netta, with a puzzled look on her face. Just when she was learning how to establish a civilized relationship with her mother, her mother was being taken away. As with any child, Netta always wanted her mother to be a mother for her when she was growing up. Time is so short, and she wished for the time they wasted. But she knew she would never get that back. Their lives were always separate ones, not like a family. Netta glanced at her mother and looked in her eyes for some type of sign of truth, but she saw none. Renee looked the same to her. She wasn't the skin and bones Netta pictured an AIDS patient to be. So many things ran through her mind she could barely drive. Netta, I know I haven't been a good mother to you. What can I say? I'm so sorry. You turned out so nice. So nice, Netta. I'm sorry for how I treated you. Her mother sat alone in the chair, even though Netta was sitting next to her. Netta was doing so good now. She was so pretty and had a boyfriend and a new car. Renee didn't think Netta would stop the car and sit her on the curb and drive off. But deep down, she knew she deserved it. Her worth as a mother was below zero. She didn't deserve the title any more than she wanted to ever carry the name. 
That's why she was Renee, and a mother was something she wished she could be so bad right now. With her head bent down, Netta could still see her tears. I'll carry this guilt I got about you to my grave. But believe me, baby, I am sorry. I can't make up nothing, Netta. I know. I remember them things I did to you. I never do nothing for you. I'm so sorry, baby. I don't want to die and you not knowing how I feel, because I'm real sorry, baby. I love you, Netta. Ain't nobody never loved me, and I ain't never know how to show it. Not even to my own. But if you don't know nothing, know that I do love you, baby. I do. And she broke down, looking at her daughter, tears in her eyes, begging for forgiveness. I forgive you, whispered Netta, unable to cry with her mother, but very much alive from her pain on the inside. If you forgive me, then help me, said Renee, pleading with her daughter. Do you know? You all I got in this world? Asked Renee as if she had finally figured out one of the key ingredients to parenthood. Netta wasn't sure what her mother wanted, but Renee seemed to want her. For whatever it was worth, Netta felt her mother's pain and wanted to be there. She just wasn't sure if her mother was telling the entire story. Maybe there's a little more. Maybe not. If you really mean what you say, I'm here for you 100%. I'll help you, Renee. There's nothing in the world that I won't do for you, she said. Renee felt good hearing that. The realization that she was dying and the way her daughter had just told her she would be there for her anyway, no matter what, meant a lot. I don't want to die in no shooting gallery high. I want to get off dope and spend my last days with you, said Renee, wiping her face from her constant tears. I'm scared, Netta. I don't want to die alone. Neither woman said another word as they rode aimlessly in silence. Netta made a promise to herself to be there for her mother. She wouldn't forsake her. Instead, keep her, despite all they had been through. She immediately called Major on a cell phone. His plans were destroyed. But he wasn't mad. Baby, I'm sorry. I can't make it. I have to take care of something with my mom. But I'll explain everything to you tomorrow, okay? His heart was touched simply by her silky tone, and Netta could feel him through the phone. She was gentle, real gentle with Major. She didn't want him discouraged or unsure of anything. She explained it was her mother, but didn't explain the problem. All she told him over and over again was how much she needed him. She asked him repeatedly did he love her, and he repeatedly answered yes. I got you. Why don't you chill? You know I got you, yo. Major said that over and over and over. So much that it shouldn't have been about dough. Only Netta didn't get that it was never about no pussy with Major. He simply liked her style. Hose was everywhere in his world. He wondered about things like that, especially when she asked him questions that revolved around how he felt about her and his paper. The next morning, Netta called Major first thing, and she told him the news of her mother. Major was in the game, and he understood. There was a lot of dope fiends becoming infected with the HIV virus. When Netta asked him to get her an apartment where she could live with Renee, he agreed. She then went to Mimi's house. First thing was some graduation gifts to open. She sat with her extended family and told them the news of Renee. 
She explained why she was moving out to stay with her mother. It's hard to think of words to thank when they extend you hospitality and take you in. How? They had exposed her to a side of life, family, and love that she had been foreign to all her life. Tears flowed from Tina, and Mimi couldn't help herself. Netta stood strong, though. She had to, for her own sake and her mother's. Upstairs, Mimi helped Netta pack her things, even though she didn't want her to leave. As they packed, Nena and Mimi reminisced over the years and the times they shared. Netta, who was unusually upbeat considering the circumstances, stopped Mimi in her tracks. I'm not the one dying. I'm only moving out. Calm down, Netta joked. Mimi wasn't joking, though. She liked having Netta around. Netta was the sister she never had. Who would take control when shit got out of control, and who would stay on her about guys, school, and fashion? Who would sit up and listen to her stories in the middle of the night when the lights were out? Netta always did her part, and Mimi was so accustomed to her being there, she couldn't help but feel saddened. As they were stuffing the last suitcase, Netta casually mentioned her new car. Oh, Major bought me a BMW for my graduation. He's the one that stole the Honda. Look, it's parked outside, said Netta. Mimi rushed to the window, landing her eyes on a burgundy 525i glistening in the sun. She felt a tiny tinge of jealousy, but she concealed it with a big smile and a hundred and one questions about the car. After two hours of folding clothes and carrying bags to the car, they were done. They were alone in the room, sitting on the beds facing each other. Well, dog, I guess this is it, said Mimi disappointedly. Hell nah, I'm only changing my address. We always gonna be family to the E-N-D, said Netta, meaning every word of it. Life with Renee took a lot of getting used to again. For her mother's sake, Netta put aside their differences. She wanted her mother to have peace in her final days. Still addicted to heroin, Renee wanted and needed her daughter's help to kick the habit. She didn't want to meet her maker as a junkie, so she went cold turkey. Her first few days clean, Renee was sick as a dog. She sweated profusely, vomited repeatedly, and had pain from her bones aching. She thought she was going to die right then and there. Bedridden, she lost her appetite. Her bowels were working overtime, and she had loose grippers, unable to make it to the bathroom half the time. Under the care and watchful eye of Netta, she fought a valiant battle against her demons. The poison was slowly leaving her body day after day. She wasn't just doing this for herself, she was doing it for her daughter. This was her way of saying, If I can do this, you can do anything. You can be anything in life you want to be. The choice is yours. Her kicking the habit was good therapy for both of them. This was the best anti-drug message that a parent could send a child. There was no way in the world Netta would ever get high off dope after witnessing Renee's violent withdrawal and recovery. At her mother's bedside, she stood vigil. She talked to Renee, giving her positive reinforcement, letting her know she was loved and cared for. Netta walked her through it day after day. Then one morning after four torturous days, it was over. Renee awoke rejuvenated, ready to face another day. Netta and Renee celebrated her victory with a big breakfast Netta prepared. 
Renee wolfed it down and made her cook more. Just as family life was beginning to resemble some normalcy, tragedy reared its evil head and Netta was hit with yet another one of life's cruel blows. While trying to elude the cops on his motorcycle, Major crashed head-on into a non-coming car. He died on his way to the hospital. Netta placed the phone by her side as she dropped her arm. She stood there in disbelief. No, there was no way. No way he could be gone, just like that. Gone from her, taken away. The steady beeping sound could be heard, and Netta looked at the receiver. Tremendously and deeply saddened, Netta placed the phone on the receiver. She didn't cry, though. Netta had realized a long time ago that death befalls everybody sooner or later. For some, it's more tragic and dramatic, and for others, it's more quiet and slow. She found death easier to accept when it struck the elderly. However, when it struck the young, it made her ask the rhetorical question, Why? Life does go on for the living. Netta picked up the pieces and kept moving. She first attended Major's closed casket funeral, paying her last respects. At the funeral home, she came in contact with many of his other female concubines. However, Major's cheating ways didn't bother her at all. In fact, she expected it. It was a man's nature to stray. That's why she rationed out the sex to him. She gave it up only when she wanted to. Netta overlooked his shortcomings. In exchange, he took very good care of her. It was a trade-off. One hand washed the other, but they both washed the face, and when it was all said and done, she had something of majors none of his other broads had. Netta had his stash. Netta was holding some major paper for major and had played her position well. Not only did she have some of his loot, but nobody knew. He was so secretive about his business with everybody, with everyone except her. He never took anyone to her house or told anyone where she lived. So the money was all hers by default. During her period of mourning, Nana turned to Mimi. Now more than before, they had a lot in common. Tragedy. Mimi's presence helped take her mind off the cloud of misery that hovered over her. They also had some catching up to do. Nana and Mimi hadn't seen each other in months. Netta filled Mimi in on the details of the accident and the money she came into as a result of Major's death. Miss May had always told her everything isn't for everybody, so she placed the amount of money in the chump change range, claiming to have only come into 20000 when in actuality, it was more like $80,000. While Netta dedicated herself to taking care of her mother, Mimi was doing her thing as usual. She formed a little gold-digging clique. They called themselves the Pussy Pound. They were just a bunch of chicks she ran into in the clubs every week. Getting good in the game, Mimi came up on cash and jewels. She was able to trade in her Honda Prelude for an Acura Legend. Though Netta and Mimi saw each other less than they planned, they were still tight. Whenever they could, they spent quality time together, just talking, shopping, and hanging out. Each unloaded their problems on the other. Mimi was on bad terms with her mother again. She thought Tina was trying to steal her son away. The truth was... Mimi had neglected her responsibilities by running the streets, and her son had bonded with her mother. 
Meanwhile, Netta was still dealing with death while trying to live her life. At times like these, Netta was overjoyed to have Mimi's company. It broke the monotony of being with her mother 24-7. Mimi was a crutch to lean on, someone to share her feelings with. Mimi was someone who'd always be in her corner and vice versa. Or at least she thought. As winter rolled around, Renee's health took a turn for the worse. She steadily lost weight despite all the food and protein shakes she consumed. Wasting away, Renee was losing her battle with AIDS. Her immune system was weakening and the fight to count numbers was a losing battle. A shadow of her former self, all she was now was skin and bones. Watching her mother's condition worsen was painful for Netta. She insisted on taking her to the hospital, but Renee refused, knowing that the doctors would only prolong the inevitable death. She wanted to die with something she never lived with. Dignity. For Renee's last days on this earth, Netta catered to every last one of them. Day and night, Netta was right there by her side. Often, they talked late into the night or until Renee became too weak to speak. Netta couldn't help it. It was learned behavior from sharing the room with Mimi those past few years. Sometimes, habits don't die. Netta used this opportunity to question her mother about her life prior to her birth. Renee, how was your childhood? asked Netta inquisitively. I had a decent childhood. I was an only child like you. I didn't have everything I wanted, but I had everything I needed, she said, letting out a long, hard cough that rocked her body and the walls of the room. Then she continued... My life was fine till dope hit the city back in the 60s. Then daddy got caught up in that mess. After that, mama wound up losing the house. So me and mama had to move into the projects. Where's granddaddy and grandma now? Netta asked. Well, daddy died of an overdose that same year he started using. Back then, dope was dope. It was way more powerful than it is today. Mama died young when you were still a baby, said Renee. Her voice got weak. It hurt her to speak about her mother. She went on just to satisfy Netta's curiosity. Some people say Mama died of a broken heart. They say I was the cause of Mama going into an early grave, she said, ashamed of the many titles she had carried throughout her life. After Daddy died, it was just me and Mama against the world, till your Daddy came along. From the door, Mama was against me seeing him. She didn't like him. He came around in his big fancy cars, and Mama knew what he did. She hated hustlers and drug dealers. She said they were the bloodsuckers of the poor. Mama warned me not to fool with your father. She said he was bad news and she wanted more for her daughter than some damn drug dealer, but I didn't listen. I chose a man over my own mother, said Renee, trying to hold back her tears. Netta listened to all this and barely said a word. This was her history, her family tree. Never in all her life had her mother ever talked to her, really talked to her, about anything she needed to know until now. This information merely whetted her whistle for more. She was thirsty to know more about the mystery man she never knew, her father. Renee filled in the blanks as best as she could, but she only partially satisfied her daughter's curiosity. Deliberately, she ignored the issue of Netta's father's identity, but Netta wouldn't leave well enough alone.
She pushed the issue. Renee, Netta softly called, interrupting her mother's story. Yeah, Netta. Her mother answered back, too weak to turn her head. Well, I... I was just wondering, how come you never not once mentioned who my father was? She said, asking the one question she needed the answer to. The question caught Renee off guard. Though, she knew one day it would eventually come. From the day he walked out of their lives, she hadn't mentioned his name in her house since. Now Netta had just opened up a can of worms and Renee was forced to conjure up the past. To make a long story short, your father chose the streets over us. I hated that man for running away from his responsibility. I hated him for so long after that. If I ever saw him again, it would be too soon, Renee angrily said. I understand how you feel about him, but did you ever think about me? That maybe someday I might want to meet him? Netta, that's your father. He ain't never been your daddy. That nigga knew me and you was living in them damn projects, and he ain't lift one finger to help us out, said Renee as her temper and her voice rose. He was too busy making babies all over West and East Baltimore. Do you think I should meet him? asked Netta innocently. Child, I can't make that decision for you. You're grown now, and that's a bridge you have to cross on your own. Yes or no, ain't for me to say. After all, he is your father, and no matter what or how I feel about him, we can't change that. All I can tell you is where to find him, said Renee, catching her breath. That's all Netta needed to hear. That's all she ever wanted to know. Since she was a kid, this was the moment she had been waiting for. Well, who is he? She asked. They call him Dollar. But his real name is Willie Johnson. He ain't hard to find. He owns a couple of bars in West Baltimore. Just ask around. Anybody know Dollar? Renee said, confident that was all the information Netta needed. Well, if that wasn't all Netta needed to hear, she damn sure need to hear nothing else. She looked at her mother as her head turned toward the window. Renee didn't say anything about the man, and Netta, having all the information she needed, decided never to question her mother again. It wasn't long after that Netta arrived home from running errands to find that Renee had passed. Her wide-eyed, lifeless body lay in the bed, staring right through Netta as she walked through her mother's bedroom door. Mom? Netta called out. It sounded so funny. The words just echoed off the walls and bounced into nothingness. Slowly, she walked across the room looking every bit of a kindergartner about to discover something new. This discovery was death. She had never seen a dead body before. God, please take my mother and wrap her in your love and shield her so she will have no more pain. God, please. Just then, Netta heard Miss May. God comes for us all, promising nothing more in life except one day you will die. There's no promises for success, no promises for wealth. No promises for happiness, love, or health. The only thing for certain in life is death. It's what you do in between life and death that counts. Then, Miss May's voice disappeared. Netta bent down next to her mother's body as she stroked her mother's forehead and cheekbones. Renee had finally lost her battle with AIDS. Netta calmly, with two of her fingers, closed both her mother's eyelids. I love you, Mommy. 
Then kneeling, she bent her head and continued to pray for her mother. She prayed her mother was right with the Lord because he took her soul, and she prayed that her mother was free from all the hurt and pain in whatever place she was. Please let me see my mama again, God. One day, one day, let me see her again. And would you tell her I love her so much? I always did love her. God, you know that. Please tell her for me. I will miss her so much. She's not here no more. She knelt down next to the bed and bowed her head next to her mother's body. There was no time to grieve once the call had been made to 911. The responsibility for handling her mother's burial fell on her. Maturely, Netta tackled the task making the necessary arrangements. She decided to cremate her mother's remains. Her decision was solely based on the deteriorated condition of the body. Netta didn't want anyone to see her like that. She wanted people to remember Renee the way she was. After the cremation process was completed, Renee's ashes were placed in an urn. There was only one thing left for Netta to do. Honor her mother's last wish. With her ashes in the urn, she drove downtown to the inner harbor and scattered Renee's ashes in the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Now finally Renee was free. Free from the pain. Free from disease. Free from the shame of her many titles. And free from the addiction that haunted her most of her adult life. She was free, like the angel she was always meant to be. I will miss you, Mom. I love you. I always did. Chapter 8 With only one remaining parent left, Nana couldn't get her father out of her mind. It was time to seek him out. She wondered whether or not she was doing the right thing. Would he even acknowledge her as his daughter, or would he deny her very existence, forever leaving her a bastard, a bastard child? She could ponder these questions forever. But there was only one way to find out for sure. One thing that her mother had been absolutely right about was the popularity of her father. Dollar's name was still ringing bells after all these years. Locating his whereabouts was easy. She simply asked some prominent hustlers she knew, and they told her about a bar he owned in South Beemore. It was a popular hangout for old-timers on Saturday nights. So the following Saturday night, Netta went to Sandtown and slipped into Legends. The bar was packed, so she blended right in with the regulars. The party atmosphere inside the bar took on a late 60s flavor, with all the old Motown records being played real loud. This was like a paradise for old hustlers who managed to survive in the game. Here, they could relax and reminisce over days gone by. Netta found herself a seat in the corner where she sat nursing a drink. Patiently, she watched and waited for the man called Dollar. Since she didn't have a clue as to what he looked like, she examined every man closely. Any one of them could be her father. She scanned a sea of faces looking for the slightest sign of physical resemblance. She saw none. Netta soon realized that her hearing would be her guide and her greatest asset since her eyes might possibly deceive her. She began to listen intently for the name Dollar. 
An hour later, in walks a tall, handsome, dark-skinned man. On his arm was an attractive, brown-skinned young lady. He made a grand entrance and was greeted by a chorus of greetings. Hey, Dollar Bill, what's happening? One man yelled. Yo, Dollar! Long time no see, yelled another. He was the life of the party. He joked and mingled with mostly all of the patrons of his bar. Standing a few feet away from Netta, Dollar chatted with some of his old partners. She was tempted to walk over and tap him on the shoulder and introduce herself, but what would she say? What would he do? Would he be angry or happy to meet her? Doubt crept back in her mind, and she hesitated. Netta knew that a conversation with her father would only raise more questions than he could possibly answer. It was obvious that he didn't give a damn about her or Renee. How will the relationship with him benefit me now? She asked herself. Where was he when I really needed him? When I was messed up in the game, living in the projects and stealing food and clothes, where the hell was he? Netta watched her father for a few more minutes. Then she got up and made her way to the door. Before she left, she glanced back over at the man they all called Dollar. She took a long, hard look at her father. Goodbye, motherfucker. Have a nice life, she said lowly before turning her back to leave. Now she could bring this chapter of her life to a close. She never wanted to see that stranger again. Anxious to put the past behind her, Netta moved out of her apartment. She was trying to escape all the death and drama she'd experienced while living in that house. First Major, then her mother. She decided to invest a little of her newfound wealth. She wanted to own her own home. This way, she would have a permanent roof over her head. She purchased a newly renovated two-story row home in West Baltimore on Monroe and Fayette Street. She purchased the house dirt cheap because the neighborhood was so bad. Before long, Netta and Mimi were hanging tough again, but things had changed now. Mimi was no longer the same naive person she had been. She got wiser and was playing more ballers than a Rutgers game. The Pussy Pound looked up to Mimi. She was their leader. To them, she was the shit. It didn't take long for Netta to wrestle away control, though. Mimi looked up to Netta so naturally, everyone else followed suit. At times, their different personalities clashed and they seemed to compete for dominance of the Pussy Pound. Mentally stronger, Netta won out. She got them to see and do things her way. She organized the clique, teaching them as she taught Mimi how to work hustlers. As a group, they would go on to make the Pussy Pound famous. Before Netta took over, they were running around fucking corner hustlers. Cats that had champagne tastes and beer money. Netta taught them how to get paid. Like a madame, she directed traffic, steering all the big boys with big names and big cars toward her clique. Instead of just her and Mimi having cars, in a matter of months, Fila. Petey and Rashida all had new luxury cars, too. Pretty soon, the Pussy Pound's names were ringing in the streets of b -more. As loud as the Hustlers, they were known for showing Hustlers a real good time. Whatever was clever with them, behind closed doors, anything goes. Everything was all good, then jealousy reared its ugly head. 
Mimi was quietly pissed that she was no longer the focal point of the clique. Upstaged by her friend, she felt Netta stole her shine. She put this thing together, and yet it was Netta who got all the glory. It was Friday night, and Volcano's nightclub was packed. Of course the pussy pound was in the house, strutting their stuff in three-quarter mink coats. There were a lot of fine and fly females in the club, but Netta and Mimi were stars among stars, and they were trying to catch. Tonight, it was business as usual. You got to pay to play. For Black, this was truly a rare night out for him. It was his 25th birthday. He was accompanied by his right-hand man, Ty. Here he was, the notorious Black, in the flesh at Volcanoes after being on the down low for months. He'd been the source of too much drama to be partying and he was too hot to get caught slipping at some club. Too many people wanted him dead. His name had been linked with too many murders and too many shootings. Now that the heat had died down somewhat, he was free to make a public appearance. It was like he hadn't missed a beat. Everybody still recognized who he was, a ghetto superstar. One of the top money-making cats in all of b -more, bar none. His name struck fear in the hearts of his enemies, while women openly lusted after him. Dipped out in ice and platinum, both black and tie turned heads. They loved all the attention they received. The envious stares from other hustlers and the flirtatious grins of the ladies made his dick hard. Figuratively, black owned the club. Even when the lights dimmed, his platinum link chain and diamond encrusted cross and platinum presidential Rolex with the diamond bezel and his two pinky five carat diamond rings, not to mention Cameron flashlights in his ears illuminated from his body like fireflies. Black was giving it to them, and yes, he was hot, walking around in that full-length black mink. But he didn't dare take it off because he was strapped. Ty, his right-hand man, likewise, was bejeweled and wearing a full-length white mink. As they walked through the club, people parted like the Red Sea to let them pass. While looking for a quiet spot to chill, Ty suddenly suggested that they head for the bar. It's your birthday, Black. Let me buy you a drink, yo, Ty excitedly said. Whatever, yo, that's what's up, answered Black. We're gonna do it up tonight. Anything is on me, Ty said like he was saying something. The fact of the matter was, Black was the one with the long money. He was the boss and Ty was the help. He could buy anything or anyone in that club many times over. If it was true money talked, then Black's paper was shouting. At the bar, Netta and Mimi were attracting plenty of attention of their own. Having shed their mink coats, they were showing off their tight fit in Versace dresses. They brushed aside smaller hustlers in search of those that could put their weight up. Hustlers with long money. They watched and they waited, making idle chit-chat while enjoying their drinks. In their own little world, they never saw Black and Ty slide up beside them at the bar. But when they glanced over and saw Black, instantly they both recognized him. This was a chance meeting. Rumors have been circulating for some time now that Black was dead, but the rumors about his demise had been greatly exaggerated because there he was standing right there in the flesh. Netta made her move on some smart luck strategy, seizing the opportunity and throwing herself at him. Oh, that's a nice cross. 
Can I see it? She said, complimenting him on his taste in jewels. Without answering, Black stepped around Mimi until he was within Netta's reach. Gently, she reached out and picked up the cross off his chest as if it had been touched by God. Cradling it in her hand, she admired it. As he marveled at her physical beauty, they both had each other's full attention. Black liked what he saw in Netta. Mimi was an afterthought. Netta had two attributes he loved in a woman. Aggressiveness and pretty dark skin. Dark skin women turned him on. The darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. To him, in his mind, there was no question who he wanted. The decision was made, and Black chose Netta. Within minutes, Netta and Black were openly flirting, and Mimi had no choice but to play the cut. After she finished inspecting his medallion, Netta carefully placed it back on his chest. Damn, if I had your hand, I'd throw mine in, she sighed, throwing game and giving him a devilish grin. Girlfriend, your hand's the best hand. You looking like one in a million. By the way, I'm black, shorty. What's your name? He asked, looking her up and down. Netta, she said without hesitating. Turning, she added, This is my girl Mimi. At this point, Black introduced Ty to Mimi and the group split in two. Each was engrossed in their conversations. While Netta had bagged the grand prize, Mimi had to settle for the consolation. He wasn't chump change, but he wasn't Black either. Netta had beat her to the punch and Boy, was she heated. Folks, I apologize, but I gotta take a pause for the cause just because I would like you folks to tune in to the next edition of Ralph Reads. I would like, or rather love, to thank you queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook. Send a friend request to Ralph Anthony Garcia on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com. Where if you'd like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407 or cash app. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also connect with me on my other channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies. And right here on T-U-R-N, tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of this Shannon Holmes miniseries on Ralph Reed's. This particular miniseries, Be More Careful, is dedicated to my beloved mother, Barbara Antonia Figueroa. Te amo demasiado, madre querida. En paz descanse.